Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you for joining us. This is part two with Dr. Hugh Ross. And if you missed part one, let me give you just a little synopsis. We answered all the questions of young earth, old earth, so there will be no more controversy. No, yeah, it's over. It's, you have to watch. No more questions. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? That would be nice. That this be. guy sitting next to me is our grandson, Justin Bailey. Hello and, again. And he's, he's uh, as far as intellect, he has passed me standing still. I've had to run really fast, though, <laughs> yeah, to do that's it. That's right. But uh, he's with us today on part two also uh, to kind of add to the intellectual part of this interview with Dr. Hugh Ross. Good to have you back, man. Thank you. Thank what a you. joy. What a blessing. A matter of days, we are going to take the second part of this fantastic book, which, by the way, the website on your screen, please write it down. You probably do what I do. You think, I want to write that down, and right now you're doing nothing about it. So <laughs> grab a pen, a pencil or something, and write it down, okay? Because you're going to want to. Then that way you can, you can go through all of the books that he's ever written, all of the subject matter, videos, where he is, his place of lectures, the place he'll be the coming year, and so on. You so can you also can, ask your grandkid to text it to you. Text you the, 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 <laughs> what, what that is, works too. Help us out. What is this new, new thing that Dr. Ross is doing? Well, he's doing some stuff for seminaries and uh, and pe people like your media personalities to create content. Uh, and so there's, there's just a funny, funny little thing that was happening before Dr. Ross gave us this card. It's got a very complex URL on <laughs> yeah. it. What, what, and is, what does that say? Uh, Vimeo.com forward slash one three one four eight two four seven four. Okay. Now he's going to send it to me. <laughs> he goes, what is this? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what this is. <laughs> yeah. He's going to send it to me and then I can. He's just going to click it. Yeah. That's what it is. And yeah. I can just click on it. Click it. Numbers, yeah. confusion, all done. Wow. All done. Thank you for being here. <laughs> You're welcome. And you see what I live with? Yeah. <laughs> it's so, unfortunate. So, yeah. But well, I have a son the same age. It, so there you go. Oh, okay, there, there you go. go. Perfect. I, I want you to take a look at this VT and just get a little idea of what Dr. Hugh Ross does, his organization. This young man happens to be on the campus of some university, some place. Take a look. Hello. I'm standing on the campus of a very beautiful and prestigious university here in Southern California. This is a place where students from across the globe, from different worldviews and perspectives, can come to study and to learn. This is a place for discovery, for new experiences. It's an opportunity for uh, students to begin to ask questions about the things that uh, matter to them, or they begin to wrestle with some of the worldviews and, and perspectives that they've carried with them to this point. I believe that some of these questions are questions that we all can relate to. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where did the universe come from? Questions like this, they matter, and we're all asking them. And that's where Reasons to Believe comes in. Reasons to Believe is a Christian organization that is dedicated to helping those who are on a journey. Our mission is to show both skeptics and believers alike that sound reasoning and scientific advance will always strengthen rather than erode our confidence in the scriptures and in the personal God that they reveal. Our team of highly educated scholars, both scientists and theologians, travel the world speaking at universities, conferences, churches, and forums with the goal being to show audiences that the latest scientific advances build up rather than tear down our faith in a creator. Let Reasons to Believe challenge you as you search and test out what is true. Let us give you new reasons to believe today and every day. Reasons to believe, tremendous. And you go on college campuses, stand on that platform, Q and A. Right. Do you, <laughs> do you ever freeze and go, Whoa, it's not coming. Does that ever happen? Oh yeah, it happens. Seriously? Sure. Even with you? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
But no, when we go on a campus, we typically speak for say 40 to 50 minutes and we have several hours of Q&A afterwards. We take any question that comes from the audience and uh, often it goes on till midnight. Wow. And I think that's what people need on the university campus. They need an opportunity to get their hard questions out there, to dialogue uh, with us and get these new reasons In to believe. In case they didn't watch part one, give us a little of your background. Yeah, I'm an astronomer. I was raised and educated in Canada. I became a Christian at age 19 uh, through studying a Gideon Bible for two years. Uh, eight years after that, I actually met Christians. Uh, that happened on the Caltech campus. Uh, they helped me find a church, and uh, I wound up uh, being asked to join the ministerial staff of that church. And it was that church that helped me launch Reasons to Believe 29 years ago. My goodness. Okay. I'm going to pick up at chapter 12. So when you get your book, I hope you go through it. It is one of the best reads you'll have. Which book is it again? It is A Matter of Days. Hey. In case you missed what, part one. What can I say? And if you shoot off of Dr. Hugh Ross, there it is right behind it. I mean, we've got it covered. So oh, this, is, this is an opportunity for you folks that are watching. Really, don't be afraid of saying, am I young earth or am I old earth? So at tw chapter 12, it says, the scientific case for a young cosmos. Give us a shot at that. Well, young earth creationists um, want to come up with scientific evidence. I mean, like me, they believe that God reveals himself through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. So yeah, they've dedicated a lot of their resources to trying to come up with scientific evidences uh, for a young earth. And so I devote a chapter to explain why once you understand the science behind each of their arguments, it transforms their argument from a young earth into an argument for an old earth. I mean, for example, one of their arguments has to do with the salt content in the ocean, uh, but they don't take into account that there's plate tectonics. And uh, what we see is a cycling of the salt on the earth. I mean, we have salt beds uh, in the prairies, for example, that used to be ocean floor. Uh, and so when that became land, uh, that became a concentrated area of salt. And with plate tectonics, the salt recycles from the oceans to the continents. So the buildup of salt is not an issue. And, 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 and I am probably... You're going to show your cards right now? Yeah, I'm probably show us cards. this person from time to time. We make statements that we have never researched because we've heard them someplace or read them someplace. How do you move past that? Well, what I tell lay people is this. If you hear a scientific argument, and it sounds like a good argument for your theological position, you want to first test how well that argument works in front of people that are expert in the field. And so it's important to field test your apologetics, your arguments for the God of I've the I've done that in front of Justin and Gatton. Wow. Here comes I, the mean old Justin again. No, no he's not Wrecking mean. Wrecking arguments. He's not mean. But I mean, he suggests that I may want to check that out. Well, that's what, you know, <laughs> there are engineers and scientists in your neighborhood, and you can say, hey, what do you think of this uh, new argument that I see uh, uh, Christians using? And, uh, you know, if you engage them in the right spirit, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with gentleness and respect, they'll actually point out to you, well, you know, here are some problems with that argument. Or they might say, no, that argument is valid. Never heard about that before. Let me study it. That's your opportunity to reach out to that scientist or engineer and bring them to faith in Christ. Have you experienced that very thing when you have yes. presented what you have studied and know the Word of God and you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And they have said that. Many times. We've seen many scientists, many engineers come to faith through Christ uh, through our messages, uh, through our books, uh, through our DVDs. Uh, we've even seen a Nobel laureate in chemistry come to faith in Christ through reading our books. My goodness. So, but you have to be patient. Uh, it took me 18 months when I first started reading the Bible to become a Christian. A fellow I know that won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in astronomy, it took him 35 years. And so what I tell people, if you're witnessing to a scientist, Realize it's going to take months because that scientist is going to check everything that you claim. He's going to go through the Bible and check everything out. That's not a bad thing. 
because when that scientist finally gives his life to Christ, he's going to be well equipped to share his or her faith with other people and give them evidence. Excellent. I didn't give my life to Christ until I knew I could defend it. Young Earth is moving on. Young Earth creationists literature present more than 100 scientific, supposed, scientific evidences for a young earth and universe. Okay, that's the young earth creationist. With that many, are they all wrong? That's what I say in the book, yes. Uh, none of them have validity. And it's something I think the younger creations themselves admit. I tell a story in the book of how I did two radio interviews uh, with the president and the vice president of the Institute for Creation Research. But the radio hosts asked Dwayne Gish and John Morris this question. Have you ever met a scientist uh, who became persuaded that the earth or the universe was young, independent of a particular Bible interpretation? In both cases, they said no. Well, the host talked to me afterwards and said, if they haven't met a single one in their entire career, that means there can't be any valid scientific evidence for their position. Because if there was, there'd be at least one. But the fact that there's none. So in that sense, even younger creations themselves admit uh, that the scientific evidence for their position is, is simply not there. Now on that point, they would probably almost take that as kind of a badge of honor, right? It's, it's a way to say, we clearly stand on the position of the authority of the Bible is our predominant, it's a predominant feature of how we see the world. And then they would critique you and say, well, sounds like you are raising nature vis-a-vis -vis science to this equal plane of authority so that one is able to sharpen the other, correct the other, or however you would want to verbalize that. Do you yeah. think that's a valid critique? How do you talk about that? What, what, how do you look at those? They critique me that way all the time. Right. They, they accuse me of putting science above the Bible. And I, again, I sign a statement uh, believing in sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. It's a Reformation doctrine that says the Bible is the only authoritative revelation uh, we have from God. Mm -hmm. But this is in the context of the Reformation. Back then, the word authority was always understood to come from a person. And what we see in the Bible is a personal revelation. It's words coming from people, as words inspired by the Holy Spirit. So unlike the record of nature, it has authority. However, the Bible tells us that the record of nature is a faithful, trustworthy revelation. Matter of fact, we're commanded repeatedly in the Bible to use the record of nature to bring people to the scriptures. So there are times where the Bible could look to say something clearly that you would learn through science would let's say contradict what it seems to say clearly and does that well, the does analogy that I would use change interpretations is that or anything you could read Romans and then read Hebrews and say I don't think these are saying the same thing mm -hmm. but hey they're both the inspired and errant word of God you're probably misinterpreting the words in Hebrews or the words in uh, Romans or maybe both you need to be invested enough in researching these texts to see how they're harmonious. Well, likewise, the book of nature is a trustworthy, reliable revelation from God. It's not going to contradict the Bible. The Bible is not going to contradict the record of nature. If you think you are seeing a contradiction, you need to look at both revelations and see where you're lacking knowledge or you've got bias. So, if the science, so take a particular scientific issue, if it seems really, really clear that this is the answer. And the Bible is maybe a little bit more vague on, on a point that somebody would argue it's being clear, but you, but you think it's more vague. You would then say, I want to harmonize the two together in this, in this issue. So I'm going to take this clear scientific revelation or, or nature's word speaking and help interpret this tougher biblical text. Is that fair or is that? Yeah, it is fair. It's based on the it? doctrine of perspicuity, that there's certain things in the Bible that are crystal clear, other things that are not so crystal clear. We're to interpret that which is not clear with that which is. Mm -hmm. Same thing's true in science. There are things in science that are very clear and things that are not. But also cries, applies when we integrate the two books. So for example, if you're talking about uh, the microwaves that impact your oven, uh, the record of nature has a lot more clarity on that than the words of the Bible. The Bible is really silent about microwaves. 
So you really want to go to the record of nature. Well, Proverbs 5.16, you look, you look that up. <laughs> Microwaves. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> let me give you an example <laughs> uh, that's a current controversy. There's a controversy in the church today. Uh, are we human beings descended from a large population or just two people? Mm -hmm. And people are saying, we look at genetics, it seems like we're descended from a thousand individuals or more. Mm -hmm. But the Bible seems to indicate two. And the Bible's got some very clear passages which state that it is two, which is causing the scientists to go back to the genetics and saying, okay, maybe we need to do experiments to see if we've missed something in the genetics. And what's interesting is when you do experiments on sheep and horses and orangutans, you always get way more genetic diversity being propagated than what the genetic models predict, which means that, hey, the Bible, uh, when it says we're descended from two individuals relatively recently, uh, this is something we need to take seriously. It's clear in the scriptures. What we see in the science is not that clear. We don't have the complete knowledge base yet. And so scripture is actually driving us to do more thorough research in the area of genetics, in the area of uh, conservation biology to see what's really going on. So project 30, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, whatever the number is, we have more clarity in that subject. You know, it's muddy right now, let's say, let's, we have more genetic clarity, we have more uh, archeological clarity. Um, what happens? What happens to, to your model when it comes to a, a single human pair? Um, how, how do you, how, how will that work? If, if it does, I mean, we're projecting it could go the other way. And you could be absolutely right about that and, and there's no problems and the Bible was clear and there's no, there's no well, issues. Well, that's a lot of what this book is about is that because we human beings don't have complete knowledge and complete understanding, there will always be anomalies in our interpretation. Things that don't seem to be quite fitting. Uh, but that's an exhortation for us to do more research and what I've learned in trying to integrate the book of nature and the book of scripture, if I do the research, the anomalies go away, but are replaced with new anomalies. But the fact that the new anomalies are nowhere near as problematic as the old ones that have been resolved tells me I'm on the pathway of truth. So I actually use that as a tool on how to resolve this controversy. Let's put these two models, old earth, young earth, to the test. We can do more biblical research, we can do more scientific research, and see what happens to the anomalies in both models. And this is the second edition. I've mm -hmm. added 80 pages of content. And over the last 10 years, what I'm demonstrating here is how the anomalies from an old earth perspective have gotten dramatically less problematic, less numerous, and from the old earth perspective has gone the other way. That should give us an indication in how we can resolve uh, this debate. Interesting. But also makes the point that the Bible, which is where young earth creationists stand, mm -hmm. I'm telling my old earth friends, if you want to get this resolved, you've got to lead with the Bible. And you have to help your young earth friends integrate all 66 books of the Bible. Because there's a principle there. Just like Genesis can't contradict Exodus, likewise the book of nature can't contradict the book of scripture. The oldest book in the Bible would be what? I would argue that the content that's the most ancient is in the book of Job. And I think that has a lot to do with resolving this controversy because an atheist point this out. Genesis can't be true because it leaves out the most important details. Those details are in the book of Job. Moses was aware that the people of the book of Job, he didn't have to repeat what Job had already given to them. And therefore he was able to add to what was in the book of Job. And a lot of the things that young earth creationists uh, will argue, they'll say, well, the sun was created on the fourth day. You go to Job 38 and explains explicitly in verses nine and 10, that the reason why it's dark before day one is not because there wasn't a sun or a moon or the stars. It's dark because God had blanketed the seas with clouds, which kept the light out. And you go back to creation day one, it says, let there be light. It doesn't say that God created or made the light. It says, let the light be. God transformed the atmosphere. And on day four, he transformed it again where it became transparent, where creatures on the face of the earth for the first time could see the objects in the sky that are responsible for the light that they've been seeing uh, since creation day one. Young people that are gifted, like the guy sitting next to me, with a phenomenal mind, is there a chance that when they 
expand their education with all of the opportunities they have today and the pros and cons about about creation and even the Word of God that it's not even it's not even relevant for today how are they not pulled away from their roots which is knowing Christ trusting Christ the Holy Spirit lives within them the Word of God is inerrant how do they hang on to that because even in politics today I, I, I estimate that the next 20 years we won't even accept the Constitution same way with the Word of God how do young people stay grounded on the essentials but yet have the knowledge that he is able to retain? Very good question. You know, I've talked about how the age of the earth is not a salvation issue, but it is an evangelism issue. Now, what I find is most helpful for young people that hang on to their faith, where their faith actually matures and grows, and they have greater and greater confidence, make them successful as evangelists. If they're able to see adults come to faith in Christ, through their sharing reasons. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give reasons for the hope within you with gentleness and respect. Equip them with those reasons, uh, demonstrate for them uh, the godly character they need to present those reasons. And when they start seeing adults come to faith in Christ, it's gonna motivate them to study both the book of nature and the book of scripture so they can give more reasons. And nothing builds the faith of a Christian than being productive in bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm a minister of evangelism in my church, and I see this as the strongest faith builder in the life of all believers. That's amazing. Do you think, um, just thinking about that and how it applies to my, my thought process, do you, psychologically, do you think raising the questions that a young person's gonna, gonna come about at some point, whether it's through higher education or just life, school of hard knocks, you know, sort of questions, um, do you think that it, it, Christians would be better off kind of facing the music and bringing up these questions and the difficulties that may lie in the tough aspects um, before, pre preemptively, as they're, as they're aging, as they're 13, 10, however old the number would be? four, five, and six. I sure, mean. yeah, whatever. So talking, but not just saying, you should believe this because I'm telling you to believe this stuff. Actually working through why it is that you as their parent or their, their mentor hold to these ideas and helping them ask the right questions, helping them learn how to ask the right questions. Do you think psychologically that that, that, that transition into adulthood or into higher education would be a key element for just I think not questions? only must we expose them to the hard questions at as early an age as they can handle, we need to be very sensitive to answering the questions that they raise up. You know, as a pastor, what I notice is in how many churches questions are discouraged. It needs to be the opposite. Matter of fact, I think we need to be aggressive in inviting unbelievers into our church. Because we don't have the answers sometimes, so we become... Scared. Scared, exactly. Well, yeah. if you don't have the answers, that's a call to do research. Yeah. Okay, I mean, a non-Christian comes into my Sunday school class, asks me a question I can't answer, I say, let me get back to you. Or can you, you work with me? You say, let me get back to you. Let me get okay. back to you. Okay. Uh, that's after makes me feel good. That's after 30 minutes of giving them an answer that <laughs> yeah, would right. probably be suitable for most. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes I, I get an atheist coming into my class and he says, can you comment on this paper that got published? And I says, well, I haven't read it yet. Let me have a chance <laughs> to read it first and then, then we'll talk. But some days it's also good to engage the non-Christian. Now, you asked a very good question. I want to research that. Would you be willing to research that question with me? Wow. And you know, let, let's work on this and see what happens. He, to pay his way through school, puts sound systems and so forth into high-end homes. I mean, we're talking about high, high, high-end homes. Mm -hmm. And a guy asked you, because you saw some of his library, and he right. had some Christian books in there, and discovered that he was an atheist, right? Yeah, he was, well, he was a Jew. He, he was an ethnic Jew, and um, and he and he was, asked you a question. Right. Yeah, he asked me a question just about what I, what I thought of this stuff. And he he spent 
five hours researching. No, I wrote I wrote four thousand words to him. Yeah, <laughs> to, of just and, right. explaining. I, I raised problems that he didn't even know were there, but I also gave him things to to think about. And I, in dialoguing with people who have differing opinions than us or beliefs or hold a different side, that we desire to head in the same direction of truth, that's important to do. It shows honesty. It shows a willingness to to you're, you're humble. You don't know everything. But you also, just like them, want to know what's true about the world, and that's basically what I was trying to do with, with in that situation. And you are doing that here and, and with your ministry. That's what's kind of where the book closes? It closes on 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. That's a text where we're told as believers we're ambassadors for Christ, and we're called to encourage non-Christians to make their peace with God. But for that to be effective, the world needs to see us being effective at reconciling our differences with one another. That's why it's subtitled Resolving a Creation Controversy. If non-Christians who are watching can see that resolving this controversy in a spirit of love with gentleness, respect, and compassion, guess what? They're going to be more willing to trust us with their questions and their concerns. How we treat one another in our divisions is very important for bringing the gospel message to unbelievers. I give you the last question. Okay, that's a big responsibility. Two minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, I like to do. I like to project into the future and kind of see where, where you think are, where you think things are going. Uh, you've been doing this now for you said thirty years. Yes. Uh, professionally, I mean, this is, is an important issue for you, and you've written so many books on it. When you think about all the debates, theologically, scientifically, philosophically, through Christian history, let's say about about two topics: geocentrism. Uh, flat earth theory, stuff like that. You see where that is now. Um, do you project that that what we're talking about here will be looked back on as one of these moments where it's just... Yeah, it will get resolved. And when it does get resolved, God will bless us with another church-splitting controversy that's got nothing to do with salvation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because of 2 Corinthians 5. He wants us to be exercised in reconciling with one another Amen. so we can reconcile unbelievers to God. So uh, all throughout church history, you've seen the church played with these similar kinds of controversies. They do get resolved. The other thing I think is significant, if you look at each one of those controversies, they were basically aimed at keeping a certain people group from getting involved in the church. And what's the heart of the gospel message? We're to take the truth of Jesus Christ to all people groups. Yeah. And so the Gentiles were an unwelcome people group in the first century. Today, we need to realize we have a mission field of scientists and engineers to reach for Christ. What a blessing to have you. What Thank a you. blessing to have you. Thank you. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.